we're going to, this tonight's demo is going to be what I'm calling basics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly run through what I do, how I do it, and why I do it. Uh, I know that some of you do, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit about sharpening and some of you sharpen things differently and a little bit about lathe maintenance and stuff. And some of you do it differently. And however you do it, if it works for you, that's great. Uh, this just happens to be the way, you know, over the years that I've come to make to make it work. So I want to start off on uh, with the lathe. And let me see if I can get, get us going here. So here's my lathe. Let me back this up just a little bit. But whenever I turn anything and I finish turning something like last, last time I turned, which was actually about two weeks ago, it was a bunch of wet wood. And when I finish with the wet wood, I always clean my, my bedways down here. Uh, I clean them up really good before I put it away because it's a, it's a cast iron lathe. So they're going to rust if you turn wet wood on them. I, uh, I use a, a scotch bright pad like this. And I put a little, uh, little paraffin wax and mineral oil mixture on it. And I just scrub it down really good and wipe it off and put it away. So the next thing I do before I get started on it is, is if, you're, if your tool rests, if your tool rest has any nicks in it, you're going to have problems getting, a, getting your tools to work properly. So this is a hardened tool rest, so it's not gonna get nicks in it, but it does rust and it does get sap on it and other things and it gets gummy and you'll be, you'll be turning along yeah. like this and all of a sudden it'll kind of hang up and then it'll, it'll jump on you like that and, and that's not gonna give you a, a good finish on your wood. So I use the same, scotch bright pad and all I do is I clean all the rust off of it really well. So that pretty much takes care of my, my lathe maintenance. When I get ready to turn before I turn, I do the simple things of I make sure that my headstock is locked down tight. I make sure if, if it's possible to use a, a uh, tailstock and this has the tailstock attached. Let me, give me just a second here and I'll see. I can get you up there a little bit better where you can see it. All right, so, so my tail stocks up. I make sure they're, both these are locked down tight. I check my speed to make sure I'm on the pulley that I want to be turning on. And that kind of covers it for the lathe. Now, we're going to do some, uh, some sharpening tonight. So I want, to, I want to step over here and show you this. This is my this is my sharpening station. You can only see part of it right now. You can see I have a I have a CBN wheel on one end and I have a, a stone wheel on the other end. And this stone wheel is no longer nice and flat, and you can't see it in the video, but it's also not very clean. So occasionally this needs to be resurfaced. Now, Don Geiger was nice enough to send me some handouts. They are a little bit late for me to get them out to you. They uh, they concern. I'll put them. I will put them in the chat room. I'll just okay. drop them right there, so some people can download them there. Okay. So what what I do to clean my stone up, and uh, I'm going to show you this is this is a this is one of Don's products here. It's a, a industrial diamond here in the end. It's designed to sit here on the the tool rest like this and slide back and forth and clean this wheel. Now I am gonna clean it a little bit because it needs to be cleaned before I sharpen tonight, but that's gonna jump me into safety just a little bit. The stuff coming off this wheel when I clean it is gonna be really nasty. You do not want to breathe it. And it's to the point where not only do you not wanna breathe it, but you don't wanna breathe it through a dust mass. You wanna breathe it, you wanna use a full respirator. Now, let me jump back over here real quick and show you this. Uh, this this is a 3M respirator right here. It comes the turn -ons? It comes with go. this particular one comes with these pink pads like this. And these pads have an activated charcoal in them. That's the reason when I'm not wearing it, I put it back in a Ziploc bag because that stops any farm particles from getting in it and the, the filters will last a lot longer. So basically the maintenance on this is when you finish with it, put your filters away. And when you get ready to use it again, put your filters on 
And you might also, since this is Florida and the inside of your mask is gonna be kind of kind of slimy in here when you breathe on it a little while, uh, you'll wanna wash it. Now, I w this is the type of mask that I wear when I work every day. So let me put this on, we'll go back over here. I'll show you how quick and easy it is to, to clean this wheel up. I don't know if you'll be able to hear me through this respirator what I'll sound like, but yeah. we'll give it a try. Yeah, that's good. It's not as crisp, but we so can hear thing, you. This thing has a little thumb wheel here that allows you to extend this diamond a little bit. So it's this simple. You just slide it across, extend the diamond just a little bit, slide it again. Don's probably much better at this than I am. It would have helped if I'd also clean my tool rest a little bit because it's sticking on the tool rest. But there it is. Now what you, there's what you get. You get a nice clean wheel. It's running true. It'll be ready to, uh, to use for sharpening now. I'm gonna take my respirator and I'm going to put my two filters back in my bag so that they last, last a little bit longer. And that gets us there. So let's cover a little bit about safety while we're talking about that. You notice that I have some safety goggles on. I also have a mask available to me. I also wear a apron. The apron helps to keep the wood chips out of your clothing, which helps keep the wood chips out of the washer and dryer, which helps make your wife happier. <laughs> because when the wood chips end up in her personal items of clothing, she's not going to be happy with you guys. All right. Anybody have anything you think I ought to mention before we get going here? Do you have to clean your CBM wheel at all? No, I, I actually, they, they do make a product for cleaning it. Uh, Rubber block. I actually use just a, an eraser wheel like you use to clean sandpaper occasionally oh, okay. on it. Yeah. And uh, they make some other products. I've, I've never used them. And uh, this is all I've ever cleaned it with and I haven't okay. had a problem. So okay. I don't know that that's the correct answer, uh, but that's what I do. All right, thanks. Does anybody else have a CBN wheel that does something different? Oh, I, I've heard WD-40, but. Jason says WD-40, I don't know. Yeah. I, I've heard just an eraser from the school section at Walmart, but I've never tried that one. Okay. What is that product you held up? What, it's a, a sandpaper cleaner, is that what it is? Yeah, it's just a rubber, rubber racer. You, okay. you can buy them at any, of the, any place for cleaning sandpaper. It takes the, the wooden chips and stuff out of the sandpaper, lets the uh, right. aggregate, cleans the aggregate. Because I know I tried, I tried with a red eraser on my wheel and it was really not good. It was kind of gummy. It was almost like a plastic eraser. So you got to be careful what it's made of. I know that. I think this is probably natural rubber. Jack, there's a statement from there's a statement from Stephen Parker in the chat room. Yeah. He says, "I use magnets in the small bags that bags that pen parts come in to collect the metal dust during sharpening. They can be yep. attached to the Wolverine jig." And I'll show you that when we when we go over to sharpen in just a minute. I'll show you that there are magnets on this one too to also get that also helps when you're sharpening to take some of that metal dust that you're going to be breathing out of the air. Richard? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the Geiger tool you were using to resurface that wheel, was it indexed on that platform some way or were you totally freewheeling it? It has a, oh, let me see what camera I'm on here. It has a groove in it right there, see it? Okay, yeah, I see it. And it's, it's not square, it's off so that it, it runs at a little bit of an angle. 
and puts that diamond in, in there. Okay, I got it. And it's got an adjustment here on it. And look, it only takes like that much. Uh -huh. just, you just you just advance that wheel just a little bit. And Don Geiger told me at one time, out of all the years he's been making these, he only ever had one guy return it because the diamond was worn out. <laughs> and he never did figure out what the guy was sharpening with it. So <laughs> if I'm wrong, Don's out there somewhere, he can correct me. All right. So that's going to get started with the with the demo, and we're going to start off. I'm going to go through uh, a series of, of different tools and and talk about them. This is obviously uh, the first tool that you should probably, if you're going to teach somebody, teach them to use. It's your spindle roughing gouge, and you know we call it a spindle roughing gouge now because the tang on it right here is really really small. It's not like a bowl gouge. That will not take a lot of pressure. You should never use this tool on any end grain. So if you've got a side grain bowl turning on it, this is not the tool you want to use on it. If you've got a bowl that you turn an end grain, you want to use it on the outside, that's actually a big spindle. You could use it. There are tools that work better. So this tool. Jack, excuse me. I just want to tell you that I've uploaded the three handouts that Don Geiger submitted to you, mm -hmm. and they're in the chat. If anybody has a problem getting them, we're also going to send them out to the email list. Okay. This tool is typically sharpened at 45 degrees right here. Okay. And you can take a protractor and you can check it, and we'll see that it's it's pretty much dead on the money. Now, when you go to, to sharpen this tool, and this one needs a little sharpening, when you go to sharpen this tool, th there are several ways shown to sharpen it. I do not suggest that you set the butt end of this tool in the, in the, into the uh, one-way sharpening system and drop the, this end against the wheel with no support on it. Because if it jams or if you have a flaw in that wheel, it's going to break that wheel. It could be a catastrophic accident for you. I suggest that you sharpen it on a platform. So let me show you how I do it. And remember, I'm just showing you how I do things. Uh, people do things differently. One of the things I want to do if I want to get 45 degrees, if I know this, this tool is already at the angle that I want it, if you'll take just a magic marker and you do a little coloring right here, color that whole bevel right there, all you'll have to do is to adjust this wheel so that when you, so that when you turn this just by hand, you can lay that on there and you can see where you're touching. Now, I don't have, I don't have it quite steep enough yet. So I'll just try it again. Stephanie, what did you do? Actually, I think John ended up accidentally uh, sharing his screen. Yeah. I've just got a Zoom screen on. Yeah, that's me what, too. Yeah, you, that's what I've got you on need to, John, John needs to click stop screen sharing. That was me. That's not it. <laughs> <clears throat> there we go. All right, there we go. So here's our, here's our magic marker, Mark. And you'll notice that I'm touching right here on the tip, which means the tool needs to turn this way a little bit more, which I've just done. Now, there are other ways to do this. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss those now. One is one of these fancy little things that you can buy. And you guys might not know this, but people that make all this stuff, they love to take your money. <laughs> wood, turners, wood turners fall right behind fishermen and having to buy everything that they can find. So you let me go ahead. And, you haven't met golfers. Uh, yeah, I have. I used to play golf. <laughs> I'm just eyeballing this real quick, get it close. Now, you see what I've got there? I've got a line. Can you see the line all the way down from the top to the bottom? So let me get a little bit clearer. 
see it. That means that I've got that this this platform adjusted perfectly for the bevel that it already has. Now, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and sharpen this and I'm gonna do it merely by placing the tool up in here and just rolling it. Now that's a much safer way than supporting the backside of it. And let's just hit it real quick. Now, one of the things I do with my spindle gouge is I kind of roll it right here on the end because I want to take a little bit of those corners off. And there's what we've got. A tool that sharpened and was sharpened safely. So, since, since we've got it sharpened, let's talk about how to use it. This is, we, we have tools that are designed to remove wood in mainly two different functions. One of them is tools that are designed to cut wood off, like this tool is. Another one is a scraper that's designed to scrape wood off. And the third way that we remove wood is we screw up with those two ways and we tear wood off. That's not the preferred way to do it. So I've got this tool where it's gonna, it's gonna meet my wood about, about the center. Uh, I'll turn my lathe down, bring my speed up. It's gonna look a little funky here for a minute because these are auto adjusting cameras on here. So just bear with me when I get round, it'll take care of it. We're gonna, we're gonna put the tool on the tool rest we're gonna engage the bevel, which is not really effective when you don't have a round piece. We're gonna raise the handle till it starts to cut. And we're just gonna take some wood off of it. And I wanna show you a little something. This is a piece of soft pine. This is what I teach with. I like to teach with it because I tell people, if you'll go get an eight foot long piece of two by four, split it down the middle, cut it about that long, about 10 inches long, by the time you practice beads and coes on all that whole two by four, you spent three bucks and you'll be pretty good at them. So, but you see, I, I picked this piece out particularly because the grain's not straight up. You see how it's, it's tearing out here? If we do the same thing, and instead of holding the tool like this, speed that up a little, we hold it at a little bit of an angle, get the bevel rubbing a little bit, You see, we've got a much cleaner cut here than we had here. Everybody follow that? Yep. All right, let's make this thing round and move on. The simple ABCs of wood turning are, we're going to put the tool on the tool rest. That's A, anchor the tool. B, find the bevel right there. That tool is not cutting. C, start the cut, which means I'm gonna raise this handle. You see, it, I'm raising it in the back until it starts to cut. And I can do that without my other hand being on this tool. The hand that's the, in the rear of the tool is the hand that controls the tool. All this one does is hold the tool on the tool rest. That's all it does. Keeps the tool from bouncing around. And you see, we're getting a, we're getting a pretty clean cut. There's the flat side. We don't have it quite round yet. There's where the grain, I don't know if you can see that. There's where the grain is, is kind of doing its little, if we were turning a, something that mattered, that would really be quite pretty. And that's round enough. Questions on that tool? That's the tool that if you're gonna teach somebody wood turning that you should begin with. It's the easiest tool to control. It's the easiest tool to sharpen. And it's, it's 
you know, a good starter spot. Now, I learned to turn the wrong way because I learned, I, I was like a lot of people, I said, I want to I want to turn bowls. So I learned to turn bowls before I learned to turn spindles. And I just forced myself a couple of years ago to learn how to turn spindles. And I'll be honest with you, I'm doing this demo, and this is the worst thing I do, is turn spindles, because I'm not very good at it because I don't practice it, because I don't make them. The only spindles I ever make is little finials, and I'll make four or five of them at a time, and then I won't turn them again for a long time. So if, you, if you're going to turn spindles, uh, you need to practice. And, you know, Rudy Lopez said it perfectly to me one time when he was learning about Ron Browning, and he told Ron he wanted to t turn a bowl. Ron says, do you want to be a bowl turner, or do you want to be a wood turner? If you start on bowls, it's a lot harder to back up and learn to turn spindles because you'll need to turn, learn how to turn beads and coves, which brings us to the next tool we're going to turn, use. We did a, uh, we did the spindle roughing gouge. Now here's the spindle gouge and you'll notice that, that I have an odd bevel on it right here. It's got a, show it to you there See, it's got a it's it's not concaved like it would come off the sharpening wheel so here's one that is concave off the sharpening wheel that light's kind of doing funny things there so you notice the difference in the, in the way they're, they're sharpened. This one's concave and this one's convexed. And I discovered that when I started to try and turn uh, pieces like Rudy Lopez turns with a bowl in the middle. I knocked the camera off. I found out that this, this particular sharp gouge here will not go into tight spots. Does anybody understand why it won't go into tight spots? Because the heel interferes. That's correct. So let's, let's take a look at this. I don't, I, I don't know what, uh, is that going to work? Okay. It's the so, camera interfering with the, the LED lights that you've got. I understand that. So, so, if you if you have a a uh, a spindle here and you you put in a hollow ground spindle gouge on it and you want to bevel it, there it is. There's the tip cutting, okay, and there's where you're making contact. So there's where you're riding on a bevel. Now that changes a little bit when you because you're not going to turn it lengthwise. You're going to turn it on. The 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 grind that I use, which goes like this makes the bevel closer to it and so it's not quite as radical in one in the in one of them if you move the tool a little bit the bevel or the cutting edge moves a lot in the grind that i use if you move the the handle a little bit the bevel only moves a little bit so that to me makes this tool more controllable so now in a little while i'll show you how i sharpen my bowl gouges I sharpen this gouge the same way. So when we get over to, to doing a bowl gouge sharpening, you'll, you'll see how I do it and how I roll this here. So this is- Does that also is, minimize catching? I'm sorry, go ahead. So that also helps you minimize catches as well with that, with that grind, I'm assuming. Well, it does because it, it, you, have to, you have to make more of a movement in the back to move the tip and so it. it's, it, it's it's less i think it's less aggressive and when we get to uh the skew chisel i've done the same thing with my skew chisels to learn on because i couldn't i every time i used a skew chisel you know i wanted to i wanted to use it as a doorstop uh because it, it just didn't work to me until i until i watched uh, a video with uh, uh it, captain eddie and he sharpened his with a rolled edge and talked about it. And I went back and resharpened my skew chisel and I was able to learn to use it. So, so let's talk about what the fundamentals, the building blocks of wood turning. 
they're, they're Jack, does, does that does that grind have a name? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, if anybody knows that it has a name, they can speak up. <clears throat> so th there there are a couple of of different cuts that you need to learn as a foundation <clears throat> for wood turning. You need to learn, learn to roll beads. You need to learn to make coves. You need to learn to make V cuts. You need to learn to peel wood off. And we'll get to all of those. So let's let's start with uh, with a cove. When you go to do a cove, what needs to happen is the flute here needs to be totally vertical. If it's this way, that tool is going to do that and screw right down it. I know none of you have ever done that, you know. <laughs> so if it's straight up and down, that's not going to happen. Okay, even if it's even leaned a little bit this way, it's not going to happen this nearly as pronounced. You see it's doing it a little bit, but it's not bad. So it needs to be straight up and down when it enters the wood, because when it enters the wood, you have no bevel support on this tip. There is no contact support at all to support this tip. So to roll up, to, to make a cove, what we're going to do is we're going to enter the wood like this. Now, if I enter the wood like this, my cut is going to go that way because your cut's always going to go the angle of your bevel. So there's your bevel right there. So my cut's gonna go in that way. If I wanna make a cove straight in, I'm gonna need to hold the tool way over here like this, straight up and down. But the cut's gonna start with the flute vertical. It's gonna start in, as soon as you get bevel support, it's, it's, the handle is gonna drop in the back. Um, you, you can't see that, but I'm gonna drop the handle because I'm gonna push the tool in and open the tool up and the tool's gonna end up up here like this. So it's a scooping motion. If you think about, if you think about uh, 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 digging digging a trench, you know, you, you, you're gonna use a shovel, and this is actually the way I remember it. You're gonna use a shovel. If you're out digging in the garden, you just take a little shovel full and throw it out, take a little shovel full and throw it out. So you're gonna come in like this, okay? Scoop a little out, bring the tip up. Now you got your shovel full and you're gonna throw it out. So let's see how this works. We're gonna start like this. We're gonna get the tip started in, okay? We're gonna advance the tool, open it up like that. We're gonna come over here, wherever we, however long we wanna make our coke, and we're gonna do the same thing. Loops vertical, tip goes in, handle drops down, scoop it out. Oops, that's what you don't wanna do. You gotta get inside this bevel or you gotta have it vertical. And there's your cove. So there's where it ran on me. I did exactly what I told you you shouldn't do. That's okay. We'll clean it up, you know, a little bit later. So, and it's those really are just tiny of, coves. I'm sorry. <laughs> little tiny coves. Those are just tiny little coves. So yeah. we'll do the same thing again. Stephanie, would you go to my iPad? Uh, hang on just a minute, folks. I need to do something. There. Okay, so watch, watch what my hand's doing back here, if you can see it. I'm entering and my hand's dropping, see it? My hand's dropping as I'm scooping. We'll do another one here and you watch it. There it is. My hand's going down because I'm advancing that tool up onto the wood. Okay, you can go back to the other camera now. Now, if I wanted to make these toes straighter, instead of coming in here like this, I'll actually have to come over here like this to get started and swing my body into it. You see this tool is swinging the whole time. I'm coming in with my bevel straight because it's, the cut's gonna start the way the bevel's pointed.
nice clean. If I hadn't uh, boogered it right there at the bottom, you wouldn't even need to sand these. Very minimal sanding. Of course, I tore that one out a little bit when I slipped. So, so that's one of the basic uh, turning blocks is codes. The next one is beads. Now, beads is kind of the opposite, where we start here and we end up like that. With a bead, we're going to start over here, but we're going to end up back there. So instead of pushing the tool forward, we're actually going to bring the tool back, and it's going to end up on its point. We start on a point to make a cove. We end on a point to make a bead. So I'll just roll some of these. So we're going to start here like this, and I'm going to make contact with the wood right here, not right at the point, but right at the edge of the point. So I'm going to turn the tool like that. It's going to come in it. I'm going to find where it's cutting, and I'm going to roll it just like that and end up on the point. Same thing over here. Find it, roll it, and end up on the point. And as you can tell, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I had about five minutes practice doing this today, so I'm not going to be really good at them. So we're going to share some exciting, exciting moments here. Okay, if we were going to turn a bead without the, without having the, the advantage of the of the uh, cove already there, we're going to we're going to have to clear some wood out to start with. So we'd start here and we'll come down, okay, and we'll start it. But see, we're gonna have all this wood in our way, so we're gonna have to back up and take some of that out of our way to have something to roll into. That's just half a bead right there, starting on the tip, rolling it in, clearing that out, come back over here to this bead, catch it right there. I got to find my bevel first, I'm going to bring the tool back until I get the edge to start to cut, and I'm just going to roll the tool. <clears throat> Question about that tool. What's the angle that you first grind that before you take the heel off? Okay. It looks pretty pretty acute. Uh, actually, this one, well, let's just find out. Let's answer your question here. I think you're going to find it is about 40 degrees. Doesn't look that much. What's that say right there? 40. Yeah. 40 degrees on the money. So the way I sharpen this tool is I sharpen the, the, the edge first where I want it, and then all I do is advance the tool by, by pushing, you know, if you're familiar with the with the the uh, the way you sharpen a bowl gouge, I just push the the uh, adjuster forward a little bit and I just roll that heel right on off. I just turn it and turn it and turn it until the heel's gone. Sometimes I clean it up. Once you get past about right here, about right there, it doesn't matter what's back here. It just allows you to get in those spots without getting catches. So, Jack, one question I have is when you when you start using a spindle gouge to do detail work on a bowl, and you're now doing side grain, uh, how does that change your use of the tool, if if at all? Uh, I don't think it changes it at all. It doesn't. It you know it's designed to turn spindles, but as long as you don't advance it over the tool rest really far because you know it doesn't have the difference in a bowl gouge and a uh, a spindle gouge is the spindle gouge has a much shallower i'm trying to get here where you can see it has a much shallower flute here so it's still a pretty strong tool and this is my my detail spindle gouge okay it's a little bit smaller it's a three eighths that was a that was a half that i had up here and you basically, it's the same thing. It'll just get into a little bit tighter spots, okay? It lets you get down in there a little bit tighter. Now, if, if I were to try and use that right there, 
if I were to try and use this one, okay, down in there, I'll show you what's probably going to happen, okay? Maybe it's my life insurance all paid up. <laughs> okay, I'm being real careful, so I was able to pull that off. But this tool doesn't do that nearly as well. This grind doesn't do that nearly as well as this grind. You almost caught the top of the, That's the correct. tool, and then you'd have one hell of a mess. Well, I don't worry about the mess, because it's just wood and it grows on trees. I worry about the safety aspect. Right, you might be eating that tool going to the dentist. So that's two of the two of the things we need to learn to turn. The next one we need to learn to turn is make a V cut. And a V cut is simple. It's just like a code. We're just not gonna roll it. So we're gonna start with everything vertical and we're gonna come in here just like that. We're gonna roll it just a little bit there. Now, remember, if I'm over here, it's going to cut the way the flute does. I want it steeper, so I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to get it right on the edge right here. Let's see if I can get that a little thinner, like we're making a, a finial. We're making a big finial. And there's that cut. Now, if you look, I've got no torn grain on either side of this, and I've got a sharp, crisp edge. Turn it off a little bit. I've got a sharp, Good. crisp edge. I'm going to give you a little bit better view of it here. All the way around. Oops. We lost something. Any idea what we lost? Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's one of the, the cuts. Any question about that one? Jack? Anybody? Yes. I see on, I see some people that turn beads and coves and do spindle work with the uh, skew. I'm so not there what, yet. What's Richard. the skew versus the, the spindle gouge? Uh, I'd ask Paula to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not a spindle person either. The spindle gouge is, I mean, the, the skew is probably the, the most difficult tool to learn to handle. And one of the reasons why is it's, uh, it's one of the sharpest tools that we have. It has the most acute angle. A skew is usually sharpened between 40 degrees and 30 degrees. All these tools that I've just showed you, the, the, Spindle roughing gouge is at 45. Now I do have one that's at 40 and I use it for doing finish work sometimes. So, and I'll give you a quick rule of thumb here on this. Remember I, I told you that this is, a, this is a 45 degree angle here. If this bevel here is one and a half times the thickness of this right here, let me move this up a little bit. So if this bevel right here is one and a half times the length of this thickness, that's 40 degrees. It's actually 38 something. If you know your trigonometry, you could do it a real quick math. I was curious the other day and Stephanie and I did it. So that's another way to know your angles without actually having to put a measuring thing on there is to, you know, is to have an idea of, uh, of what, how long your bevel should be here. So this is 45 degrees. I've got one that's 40 degrees that I use on softer stuff because it gives a little bit cleaner cut if I wanted, wanted to, uh, to do that. Questions on that? <clears throat> you don't have a horizontal camera from your side. How far above center are you hitting the wood? Uh, my, I'm trying to put, when I'm starting or I'm ending, depending on what I'm doing, I'm generally pretty much on center, okay? This, this tool right now, I've got this tool perfectly level, and, and it, that's on center. If I put it up there, that's, that's pretty close to being on center. Now, if I'm turning a, a cove, I'm going to start with it pointed at the center, 
but the handle is going to drop and I'm going to end up with it up here on top like this. If I'm turning a bead, I'm going to start with it on top above center and I'm going to end up with it down here pointed at the center. Did that answer that, your question? Yeah, that, that did. Because I, okay. I, I got the two by fours piled up and I made a mess. And roughly, what <laughs> speed are you running that at, do you know? Uh, no, I'll tell you. I'm running it whatever's comfortable. I don't ever look. Yeah, about 2,000, roughly. So somewhere in there. I, I rarely look at the, <laughs> the, the RPMs, and I'll tell you why. Because people should turn at the speed that they're comfortable. If you're not, if you're not comfortable turning at 2,000 RPMs, turn slower. You know, and it also depends on the piece of wood you're turning. This, uh, this is locked in here pretty good because it's locked in a chuck, and it has, has a uh, tailstock onto it, a live center on the tailstock. So it's pretty secure, and I'm not cutting anything. I'm not cutting the finial, so it's not real thin. It's not likely to come out because I don't have a face shield on because I want to see you and talk to you. You know, I have, I have safety glasses on instead. So, uh, but never turn faster than you're comfortable. As you turn longer and, and, and get better at it, you're going you're gonna to pick your speed up because your speed's going to give you a cleaner cut as you move along, especially if you start doing things that you're turning air, doing wing vessels and, and uh, that type of thing. And somebody else had a question. Jack, yes. Jack, there's a statement from Stephen Parker. Um, he says, Cindy Drosha <laughs> has a sharpening video. Her 3 8 inch spindle gouge has a similar grind. Okay. There you go, folks. Free video from Cindy. And I got to tell you, Cindy does, a, does some fantastic demo work. It's some of the best I've ever seen. So, all right, that gets that tool down. What tool would you like to see next? Are we, are we, are we brave enough to try this one? Oh, yeah. Okay. A skew chisel. Okay. This is a hologram skew chisel. Let me get back on my crate. This is a hologram skew chisel. It's a little bit harder to control than a uh, convex grind on here. And to do a convex grind, you know, you lay this thing up on, on your platform and you slide it back and forth across your wheel like that. And it gives you this hologram. To get uh, a convex one, all you're gonna do is, when you finish, you're just gonna raise it on up into the wheel a little bit more and it's gonna take this off. It's like taking the heel off anything. And that's a little bit, that's what I had to do to learn on and it helped me a lot. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, I, I told you before, spindle turning is not my thing. And the skew chisel is, is the hardest tool to handle. You'll notice here that this grind, this bevel here that comes to right here is a little bit about the same width as this here. This, this total grind right here is probably 40 degrees. Let's find out what we got here. No, it's going to be a little sharp, a little duller than that. This one is. Where are we at? We're right there. Oh, look at what it says right there. Can you read it? Mm -mm. Oh. How about now? Yeah, it's about, for, about 41 degrees. Yeah. So it may have been it may have been 40 before I honed it again. And we didn't get into that, but uh, uh, when we get to sharpening, and this is this is an easy tool to hone. Just set it on the heel, bring it up to the edge hatches, just do that a time or two. Set it on the on the on the back of the bevel, bring it up, do that a time or two. That makes a lot of difference, just that little bit. So let's talk about this tool. This tool is is really good for some things. It it you'll notice here, we got some torn grain right here. Can you see, see this torn grain at all? I don't know. Yeah. My lighting is general lighting and I can't really, maybe I can try. Let me see if I can swing this camera, this light around here a little bit and see if that'll help. No, not really. All right, that's not going to work. In, anyway, I've got some torn grain here, and I'm going to show you what this tool is actually excellent at, is, is getting rid of that. And it's the same as every other tool. We're going to anchor the tool. We're going to find the bevel. 
we're going to back the tool up and raise the handle until it starts to cut. Now, in the case of the skew chisel, that cut needs to be on the bottom half of this tool. If you get up here on this end, you're going to get a catch. So when you, when you engage the bevel, bring the tool up, Okay, and it starts to cut. Can you see where it's cutting right there? See the see the fibers coming off right down here? Hang on a minute, folks. Don't get seasick on me. All right. So see it, see it coming off right there at the bottom now? All you do is the same thing every anchor the tool, find your bevel, raise it up till it starts to cut and advance the tool. You see those shavings are coming off the bottom half of that tool. If you start with anything less than 800 grit sandpaper, you're going to dull that up. That's how smooth <clears throat> that, that this tool makes. So if you're making hollow forms and everything, it doesn't have to be a spindle, a hollow form, an ingrained hollow form is a big, you can use this tool. Now, it does have some limitations. Uh, when you get into big pieces, it's hard sometimes to keep it on the bottom. Now we've got a we've got a toe and we've got a heel, and they're used for different things. If we take if we take the toe, we can we could uh, start us a V cut like this, and we can do that same V cut that we were doing before. All I'm doing is starting on this toe, and as I start in, I'm turning the tool just a little bit. Once I get this tip supported, it's got to be straight up and down. It's got to be perfectly get right there. straight up and down. If it's leaning this way or it's leaning that way, all oh, hell breaks loose. What you're afraid of is the worst thing. So there it is straight up and down. Let me try it right here. Here it is straight up and down. Hang on. Different angle. There it is straight up and down, okay, nothing. If I lean that tool that way, see what's happening? If I lean that tool this way, see what's happening? You can't enter the wood. Now, once you've entered the wood with that, and you have something for it to sit on where it can't do that, then you can, you don't have to be straight up and down anymore. So if I were doing this piece right here that was already done and I came in here with the toe and I got it supported, I could come in here like that. Okay, I can come over here and do the same thing. I've got the tool anchored. I found my bevel. I'm just dancing that cutting edge so it starts to cut. There it is. And it broke out on me because I got it too thin. But that's what it'll do. Now, you can roll beads with it. I'm not very good at it, but you can. Same thing, tool gets anchored. You, you find the bevel, you bring it up on the bottom half of the cutting edge, it starts to cut, and you roll it just like you did the other tool. Okay, same thing over here. Anchor it, bevel, get the heel, cutting, and roll it. Now, in this case, we're going to have some wood here in our way. Let's get it out of the way. Roll the tool. Oops. That's why everybody's afraid of a skew chisel right there. Because they're just about done and they get those. And you won't get them if you practice, but I haven't practiced, obviously. <clears throat> I'll tell you how you're supposed to be done, not necessarily how I do it. All right. So I should have practiced more this afternoon, shouldn't I? Now, so. That's how you roll a bead with it the same way. It takes a lot of practice. And that's the reason whoever asks why people don't use a skew chisel, that's it. See the big torn out piece here? So let's clean some of that back up. Now, another thing that a skew chisel is really good for is just make a peeling cut. It lays the tool perfectly flat. Bring it up here. We'll bring it up on the floor. Bring it up here. Find the bevel. Back it up. There's your tenon. If you're making a straight sided tenon for like a, a uh, one-way chuck, there it is. That's all there is to it. It's nice and clean. You can come back and clean up the sides. 
Uh, anybody want to see anything that I can't do with this? <laughs> Have I entertained you enough? Jack, when you do a peeling cut, is that on the upper portion of it or the lower? Uh, you could do either one. If you, I like to do it on the on the toe here because it, it uh, if I do it on the heel, it it uh, doesn't give me as straight a straight a tenon when I finish with it. But I don't use the tool much because the only time I ever use it, Jason, is when I'm turning finials. And on a finial, the finial is so small. If you're afraid of this tool, a finial is a good thing to turn it on because it's a, a little bit easier. You don't get nearly as many catches with it. And I have a small <laughs> to turn in that. So, so, just to re so just to review real quick. So when you're doing the planing cut, you're on the bottom half. When you are doing- I don't call that the bottom half. I call that the toe. Okay. Like and your toe heel. sticking out and the heel, like your foot. Okay. 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 So so you're using the, the lower, so you're using the heel when you're doing a planing cut for when you're rolling beads, you're leading with the heel. You're actually putting that point, the point of the heel into the wood. Is well, what's... actually, it's not the heel. It's just if, you, if you're doing a cut, it's actually off the heel. If you use the heel itself, Jason, uh -huh. if you stick the heel in here, here's, what's, here's what you're going to get. Okay. You're going to get, see it, push that wood forward. Uh -huh. See that? Yep. That pile of wood you're pushing forward. If you get off the heel a little bit, okay, and off the heel a little bit, you see I'm not doing it now. It's cutting the wood off. Ah. Uh. Wood. If I bring it up on the heel, it's going to push it. If I back it off a little bit, it's going to cut it. Okay. Got it. So, so you're you're just shy of the heel then. Okay. Yeah. Just bottom half between the heel and the middle. That's, okay. That's the secret. And you got to keep it on the bevel. All this, all this stuff I messed up is because the, this, this tool is, remember it's 40 degrees. And so it's as radical as any tool, as sharp as any tool you've got. And I've actually got one that's 30 degrees, but it, uh, keeping it on the bevel is the hard part. Now, when you roll in a bead, you know, you've only got a little teeny little spot there that's bevel. Right. It's real, real, real small there. So if I get, when I start to roll that, if I get that edge in and I don't have the bottom part on the bead, it's going to do one of these numbers. It's going to tear stuff out. So that's the way it's done. Uh, I'm going to save the bowl gouge to last. So let's, let's talk about, let's jump the gun here and talk about scrapers real quick. And then we'll uh, we'll go back to the bowl gouge. Anybody have any questions so far? I know you're yeah, kind of. Can you eventually show us how you get that rounded profile on the on the skew when you sharpen? Yeah. I, well, I wasn't going to sharpen it, but Jason, I can show you now. Okay. When I lay, if this is my if this is my sharpening wheel, when I lay it in there and it's on my platform, it's flat on this platform just like that, and I put it in there. All I do is I just roll it like this. So I, I may start here and I'll just roll it and advance it just up. So just like that and roll it and bring it up a little bit. And it'll give you that little roll. Okay, now, got let it. Me grab a, let me see if I've got another skew here real handy and I'll show you a different one. Now, I also know people do flat grinds because um, I understand when you do the, when you do the um, hollow grind, it's either on or off, right? In terms of whether it's cutting. Is, and I understand with your where, where you're doing this concave grind that allows you to slowly accelerate the tool. You can do a there, you can do a flat yeah. ground. Yeah. On, on the side of your wheel. Yeah, like on the side of a CBN. I hear people talk about flat grinds. I'm just wondering is there a is there a different benefit to a flat grind over this curved grind that you're doing? Uh, it's. I would think that it's a little bit more control. I, uh, Charles Watson's on here. Charles does a flat grind on it. And Charles is a lot better with a skew than I am. So, uh -huh. uh, Charles, you want to tell him why you do your flat grind? I see him there. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I do anything from, from concave to convex, Jack. And okay. 
the more it's like your spindle gouge. If you make it slightly convex, you got a little more co control when you're in close. Mm -hmm. Did that help you, Jason? I, you yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Use, I use them interchangeably, really. Yeah. So, okay. So here's one that's pretty well flat ground, Jason. It's uh -huh. it's a little one. It's a little one I use on uh, on spindles. Okay. So Henry Taylor. Here's a here's a different one. This one's an oval shaped one. Now, these oval shaped ones sound really cool because they're easier to roll. But I got news for you. They're a heck of a lot harder to sharpen because you almost have to make a jig to sharpen them. Otherwise, you end up with them looking like this. Now, this one's got a the convex on it. And here again, it's the same way. You know, you bring it in here, you anchor it, bring it up, roll it. It doesn't it hadn't change much. That's the same thing. So, so I've got a little bit of all of them. If that, if that helps you at all. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, sometimes I make a tool for a specific job and whatever I've made it for, I really like what I end up with. So, you know, I use it for that or I convert it to use it for something else. And it's just, you know, it's kind of playing with them. So, I'm gonna get. The, I'm gonna turn the bowl gouge last because we're gonna to have to change. I'm gonna put a bowl on here or put a fixture up here to turn a bowl on. So let's let's talk about uh, scrapers. So the interesting thing about cutting tools is here's a cutting tool here. That tool, that tool right there. That tool right there is safe. Can everybody agree with that? If it's touching the wood, if this is the wood right here and it's touching the wood right there, that's the bevel. It's perfectly safe, correct? Everybody agree with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as it comes down and it starts its cut right there, that tool is supported. It's got the, the bevel back here supported on this piece. So that's a control cut. Now, what happens when it comes up here and the bevel comes off the wood? Catch. You get well. It may be. I mean, I do a lot of turning without a bevel support with a bowl gouge because uh, they can get it in tighter spots. But that's where you get your catch. That's where it can't get a catch here, okay? And you're not likely to get a catch if the bevel supported properly. You get up here and you're going to get a catch. So from from the supported bevel back down, that all this in here is safe on this tool. Now a a scraper is totally different. A scraper is not supported. It doesn't have a bevel. So if this is my wood piece and it's turning, that's safe right there. I'm trying to get this where you... That's safe right there. And it's safe all the way down to about 90 degrees. And once you get past 90 degrees, that's guaranteed to get a catch with a scraper. So what we often do with scrapers is we raise the handle in the back. Stephanie, please go to my uh, iPad picture, please. <clears throat> a little bit. So clear that. So we raise the, we, we, we line everything up to be in the center like this, I need to raise it up just a little bit. We'll round everything up to be in the center where the tools level across here and it's engaging the wood at the center point, okay? Now, to be safe, we raise the handle up just a little bit and that lets this angle right here always stay less than 90. So what we get is we get a scraper and it's straight and it'll be fine. If we drop that handle down, we are, go we are going to get a catch. Now, to avoid having to do that, we came up with a negative rake scraper. And all a negative rake scraper is, if, if this is a scraper and there's your scraping edge, all we did is we did the same thing, but we made this up here that relieved that. So 
let me draw you a little picture so you'll understand what I'm trying to explain to you. Because I don't think I'm doing a good job. So here's a conventional scraper. It's like this. Different color. It's like this, okay? There's your edge and there's your tool, okay? As long as this piece of wood right here is 90 degrees here or less, that's 90 degrees or less, you can't get a catch with this tool. So what we've done to make sure that that happens is we raise this tool up back here so that it's like this. Now we're less than 90 degrees here, so that tool's safe. Everybody see that? What we've done with a negative rate scraper is we've just come back here and we've made the tool like that. That's all we've done. That's now the top of the tool, but we're able to hold it level because this is now less than 90 degrees from here to here. Everybody follow me? That's all a negative rake scraper is. A lot of people ask me that sometimes. They don't understand what it is. What, <clears throat> yes. what angle do you first grind a scraper off? Hey, I know the scrapers aren't 90 degrees. They're, okay. what, 10? So, so here's, a, here's, I'm going to answer your question. There's a negative rake scraper. Okay. Here's a standard scraper. Okay. If I were to, if I were to line those two angles up, See if I can get it where you can see it. If I were to line those two angles up, you'll see that this one is more acute. But now, let me bring in this scraper. Look at this booger. This is only slightly different angle than a skew chisel. A skew chisel makes a great scraper, by the way. This yeah. is a Rudy Lopez scraper, okay? <clears throat> and the nice advantage of it is it's mirrored on both sides. So if I want to scrape with it this way, down here like this, I sharpen this side of it. If I want to scrape with it this way on a bowl, I sharpen the other side. Because all we're doing when we sharpen it is we're pulling a burr on it. And so we have a burr one way or we have a burr the other way. Now, let's see. This one is this one's sharpened to cut this way, I'm pretty sure. So when we flip it this way where there's not a burr, we'll get a little bit. But see, that's not... That's not really cutting. This is cutting. This, Rudy was telling me that, that this tool actually is pretty catch proof. Because if you wanted to make this angle greater than 90, like we're talking about, you would have to come into the wood. This is the wood. You'd have to come into the wood way, I'd have to drop the handle way down and jam it in like that. And he said he had a student one day who got a massive catch with him. And when they looked at him, that's exactly what he'd done. He dropped the handle way down and he jammed this tool in and got a massive catch on it. So easy, good tool to use for cleaning up like the bottom of a bowl. I mean, it's, it doesn't do a whole lot here on a spindle. You clean it. If you'll notice the problem with it is it's like all scrapers. You're scraping grain off. See how rough that got again right here? Whereas I can come along with my, well, you saw it. I can come along with my skew chisel and clean it up. So a cutting tool generally is going to give you a much better finished surface than a scraper. But a scraper works really, really well to get tool marks out of like the bottom of a bowl. That's where it really, really excels. And I've got probably literally 20 or 30 different scrapers of different size. This is a box scraper. Uh, that's 90 degrees right there. So you can stick it down in a box and this won't touch the side and, and cut with it. This is a box scraper, uh, excuse me, this is a box scraper that I made off of Jimmy Clues. I saw one of Jimmy Clues that he sold so that, cause I like a rounded bottom in my boxes and I make a lot of boxes. So I made this one. This is a Rudy Lopez for the bottom of a bowl. And I've got a whole bunch of others around here and they're all cut for different things. Uh, let me grab one and I'll show you. Uh, here you go. Here's one made for getting under the lip of a bowl. If you want to get, you know, if you want to make a hollow lip underneath it, that lets you reach back up in there. And I've got two or three like that. But So scrapers can come in a lot of different shapes and forms. Um, 
you could pretty much make any of them negative rake scrapers, but it, it uh, when you get something like cutting under the edge of rim, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do that. So, everybody with me so far? Jack. Yeah. Three people just, said Jack at once. Go ahead, yeah. Richard. Go, oh, Richard. Um, on that first scraper you had that was like straight, flat. Okay. And then on the angle that you would grind it, it wasn't 90 degrees, like just a piece of steel off the yard, but it was ground at a slight angle. And it's just a straight scraper. Yep. That ain't you're talking about. Let me get the camera here. You're talking about this angle right here? Yep. That's the one. Oh, I don't know. We'll measure it. It's probably about 80, 70 to 80 degrees. Probably 80 degrees. Yeah. How about 75 degrees? 75 degrees. But it can be anything. Look, let, let me show you what I mean. No, I just was curious as to what it was. It's remember this tool? Yeah. Remember what we called it? Skew. Yeah, watch this. It scrapes beautiful. Makes a great scraper. The nice thing about a skew is it's usually pretty sharp and you use a scrape on either side. But see, it did the same thing. See the torn grain? Yeah. Right here. That cannot compare to this. And unless you just like the sand, you know, I like to get as close to this as I can. But I got to tell you, sand, sandpaper is a tool. Don't ever let anybody make fun of you because, you know, you have to start with 80 grit sandpaper. I turned a lot of stuff. In fact, there's a bowl I'm going to turn here in just a minute. It's going to tear out because it's uh, it's in bad shape. But we're going to play with it. So, Jack, could you also yeah. demonstrate straight, uh, how you would use a spindle gouge for scraping? Because there's been many times yeah. I've you to, and I feel like it's going to fly out of my hands you can do that you can take it just like this you got a wing right here you can turn it up here just like this on that wing catch it and come right down here with it now is that a scrape or a shear cut well that's probably a shear cut if you wanted to get a scrape out of it you'd turn it on around like this okay so it's it's a lot like a gouge it's just a different yeah, angle. it is a gouge yep it's exactly like a gouge because that's what it is yeah, well, I get it. A bowl gouge works better for that because right. this uh, uh, it just does, and and I'll, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. In fact, this okay. I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and cover that. I'm to the bowl gouge. Does anybody want to know anything else about any of the other tools that we've covered before I move on? Jack, one comment. Yes. When uh, I saw a demonstration up at the nationals, and they said when you're using a scraper like that that if you're coming off with powder, it's dull. Yeah. But if you're getting big pieces off of it that is cutting it off, then you're sharp. So it lets you know when you need to sharpen one of them. So, so let me explain to you how a scraper works. When we sharpen the bottom of the scraper right here, when we put it in to the grinding wheel like that, it rolls this, it rolls this just a, very 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 thin edge right here up it gets hot and it rolls it up and it causes a burr across here okay and that burr is what we're cutting with it does not last long it it in the cases of uh, if you're turning like a, a, a spalted bowl or something you may literally get one pass from the bottom to the top and it may be totally gone now you can pull a burr on it with several different tools they make with carbide things that pull it. I, I like to grind a burr back on it. But a lot of times if I'm in a hurry, I will grab, and I'll show it to you. I'll grab just a file. This is just a diamond file right here. And I'll just lay the tool down, catch it up here. It doesn't, you don't have to be on this heel because it's a scraper. I can be right there on the edge and I can just hit it two or three times. And now I've got it sharpened again. So, 
the same thing the same thing is kind of true with any of these tools if you if you have this tool and it's starting to get dull okay before i take it to the grinder i hit it with a hone on the outside edge like this real quick rolling it that's all you got to do i've got a little hone here a little diamond hone there i drop it in the flute that tool is sharpened again. It's ready to cut another yeah. Yes. Um, there's a there's a comment from Stephen Parker, mm -hmm. and he says Alan Leister has excellent skew videos outlining the use and sharpening. Yep, Alan is the skew master of the world, as far as I'm concerned. I watched him take an inch and a half skew one time and turn a top that was about an, I don't know less than a quarter of an inch. And he put the curve in it and everything. I was amazed. Alan also makes a great a great hook tool. We're not going to talk about hook tools tonight. So I'm to the bowl gouge unless somebody wants has a comment or wants to ask another question or wants me to show you something. Jack, how about um, like when you use a scraper? Some people say do it at a 90 degree angle. I'm not quite sure what that. You know, they say use the you know tip it up. Well, Have I discovered that? that, Rita, talking about a, a negative rake scraper is a scraper but, but that you I mean, don't have to tip up. Okay. Yeah. okay. If, you want, if you want to use a, a, a non-negative rake scraper, okay, like uh -huh. this right here, if that tool, this is my piece that I'm, that I'm cutting, if that right. tool is at 90 degrees or less while it's turning, okay, let's do it this way. There's my piece of wood that's turning, uh -huh. okay? Here's my piece of wood that's turning. Right. If this tool is pointed at the center or below the center, it's safe. Once that tool points above the center, so if it's at less than 90 degrees here, talk about a tangent to this, if it's less than 90 degrees, this tool is safe. As soon as you go 92 degrees, you got to catch. Right. That's, that's okay. the reason a negative, that's the reason we tilt the tool up. We hold the handle up, okay? We hold the handle up like this into the wood so that we don't get a catch. The way we avoid having to do that is we put a bevel on the top of it and make a negative rape scraper out of it. That's all that's done. That means that if we slip below that level, we're not going to get a catch or we're less likely to get a catch. Do you, and do you always – I think that what I was – um, I, I got that, but I think what I was asking is, when you put it on your tool rest, is it always flat? I mean, you know, the whole thing. I, I'm not explaining it well. Um, your tool, your tool yeah. needs to point. If it's a standard scraper, it needs to point to the center of the piece you're turning or below center of the piece. The tool needs to point that way. If it's a negative rake scraper, it can point at the center below it or maybe even slightly above it so what happens a lot of times rita is that people will be turning like with a scraper and they'll have the handle up okay and as they if they're scraping along they'll you know lose their train of thought and they'll let that handle drop just a little bit and they got a catch and a catch right. with a scraper is scrapers take it'll tear a big chunk of wood out yeah so rita, were you meaning that 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 the tool needs to lay flat or, or that you might raise the tool up on a corner on the, like, on the tool? Like, so. like if you're, this is your tool rest, I don't know if you can see, if this is your tool rest, you know, is your, is your, or do you turn it like this? You twist it. You're talking about trying to make a sheer, a sheer. Like trying uh, to twist right. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can do that. There's a couple of problems with that. One of the problems is if you, if you get any kind of catch at all, it's going to pinch your finger or you okay. got it kicked up. I lay mine, I lay mine okay. flat. If I want to, if I want to make okay. a sheer scrape, I'm not going to yeah. use a scraper. I'm going to use a bowl gouge. Okay. That, that, that was what I was asking. And I'll get, to, I'll get to a sheer scrape with a bowl gouge. Yeah. We'll get to a sheer okay. scrape with a bowl gouge in a minute. Okay. okay. Any other, any other questions? Oh, I'm fixing to lose one of my devices. It's got a dead battery. Okay. 
That one's gone. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the. We are, in case you guys didn't notice, we we were running some different equipment tonight, trying some different stuff, and one of the things I have was an iPad out here where I could actually see what you're seeing, because I don't get to see the same thing you're seeing, and I just lost it. So now I'm just gonna have to wing it. So hopefully you'll, you know, I won't know what you're seeing. So if you don't see what I think you are, tell me. Bold gouge. This is this is a, a five eight. Uh, Ellsworth hardened. Uh, my thoughts are, don't buy it. It it doesn't stay that sh that much sharper, that much longer to be t half again as much money as the other one to me. But a lot of people swear by it. It's got a. Let me change this camera and you'll see. It's got this Ellsworth grind on it, which is swept back here. It mine's a little bit high right here. It's got a little roll to it. The grind is perfectly straight. Some of the uh, Don Geiger was kind enough to send him, send me some stuff earlier that you'll be getting in the email. If if you guys that are from other clubs, you want a copy of it, I guess if you drop me an email or or Don may even have it on his website. I don't know. It's um it's in the chat. Okay, it's in the chat. Go download to the chat. It. Right, they can download so it from the this chat. Is, the grind on this is this this standard grind, and I don't know if I've got one. I bet I do if I look just a second. Dig through my vast selection of so here's here's a grind that starts off the same as this grind. Okay. There is no difference in these except this one has two relief cuts made on it, as opposed to the this other one does not. The angles on it are the same. It's an Ellsworth swept back grind. I find that this tool is the most versatile tool that I have because I can do so many things with it. So I'm going to show you, we'll, we'll, we'll jump over to this one. I'm going to show you how I sharpen it and how I get the, uh, the different relief grinds on it because the way I do this one is also the same way I do my spindle grinds, except I have my, my uh, fixture, my very, my very grind, and I'll show it to you in a second, at a different angle. So. Let's jump over here. Okay, I'm gonna change you a little bit so we're on to this wheel. Okay, let me see. Just bear with me, I'm trying to get it where you can get a good picture of it here. Okay, so this, this is a set uh, from David Ellsworth. It's a set jig for doing his grind. This jig is the Wolverine jig, which is adjustable. This particular one happens to be set to to do my uh, my spindle gouges, and I've got another one under there that's set for some other things. You can set this angle, you can set the distance, you can set the tip that comes out, so you can get a multitude of different types of grinds for this. So in the case of, of the bowl gouge, the tool goes in here like this. It's real simple. Most of you probably know this. It, it, you know, it gets extended so so far out. In this case, you know, that's where it gets extended, right there. That gives me the protruding I want. It gives me the angle I want. Now all I need to do is place this, which is this is a Don Geiger add-on. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons I like it is because it has this movable pin. Don's changed this a little bit around now. Now it has a block that goes in here. But this is set up for 60 degrees here. If I advance this up there that, now I get about uh, 50 degrees. And if I go on up, I get about 40 degrees. So that's the way I make my three bevel cuts. I'm gonna start here and make my initial cut. Okay, now this has to be set. And the way this particular one gets set, the easiest way to set them is to do this. See all that writing all over there? That fits right up against that wheel, just like this. And the heel goes in the back of this right here like that. So if I were to use it, there's the way it gets used. Okay, and you can make these for all the different kinds of grinds you want. And I've got all kinds of notes here because I can't remember them. So I make myself notes on it, just a little piece of plywood. But this particular grind, this is the way uh, 
this is just a step off. I'll put it in here like this. It gives me my, dis my distance, which it should be about the same that we just had. It may be off just a little bit. Bring it up so it touches the wheel. Lock it in. Now I've got my height. I've got my distance. I've got the amount of, I, I'm going to protrude here. So this tool is going to set in here like this, and it's going to rotate over in one motion, and that's going to give me this grind, and I'm going to show you that. But what I'm going to tell you first is that, double check that. What I'm going to tell you first is that a lot of people start here on the tip and roll it one way or roll it the other way. I do not do that, and the reason I do not do that is because this tip has the least amount of metal in this whole cut, this sharpening I'm going to make. So if I start on this tip and I get it in there too much, I'm going to have to take a lot back off these wings to get my profile. The wings are a lot thicker. There's going to be less, they're going to cut a lot slower. And so I'm going to start over here like this. I'm going to stand to the side so that I've got complete free motion to turn this thing. I'm going to start right here like this and I'm just going to roll it over. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little dull spot right there. And the reason that little dull spot right there is because it's on the left, left wing of this tool, and that's where I scrape with it. It's where I make my shear cuts with it. I use this wing a lot more than I use the other wing. So that's always going to be my dullest spot. So come back over again. I may do this a couple of times. I'm not going to sit on that tip. If I sit on that tip, I'm going to blunt it down. And once you get a flat spot up here, then you have to do a lot of work to get it out. So there's my initial grind, okay? That's the complete grind. Now, I wanna relieve that grind. So all I'm gonna do is come back here to this pin, which you can see, barely see it in your screen. And I'm gonna advance that pin up one little spot right there, okay? I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do the same thing again. Only this time, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be sharpening the, the, uh, the tip. I'm going to be sharpening it here, and I'm going to do that one more time. Now, I don't normally do that on my CBN wheel because this 180-grit CBN wheel or 600-grit CBN cuts so slow right there. I normally do it over there, and I have two fixtures so that I can do it all at the same time. So, oops. Questions about how to sharpen it? Are Jack, you did you want to talk about your magnet and collecting little bits of Yeah, if you'll, if you'll notice, right here is a magnet. Okay, I don't want to get my finger in there. See it? That's all that steel you don't have to breathe right there. There's also one over there. It's just a little natural uh, earth, rare earth magnet. And I just dropped it on the inside right there. And every now and then I pull it out and clean a little of the steel off of it and throw it away. So as soon as that cut, it's catching most of the steel. So I'm not breathing it. How are we doing on time? What time is it? It's 8.52. Oh, okay. Well, if it's bedtime, folks, you know, I understand. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you a few, a few things you can do with this on a spindle. Because you can also use it on spindles. Just because it's called a bowl gouge doesn't mean you can't use it on a spindle. So it doesn't really do well to try and roll something because it's kind of big and bulky. So you can't really go in here and roll very well, but you can actually cut a code with it. You gotta really get over here because it's not, remember this has got a 60 degree angle on it here. And the one we were using before had a 40 degree angle. So you can do that. You can even roll a, roll a bead, just not very well because you've got to move your hand a whole lot. So this is not what this tool is designed to do. But it'll do it. Now the problem with it is, is you let people get too comfortable with this tool, it's harder for them to go to a, to a sharper tool. It's kind of like learning to use a scraper and then trying to learn to use a chisel. If you're teaching somebody, that's not the way to do it. If they learn to use a skew chisel, they can use anything. If they learn to use a scraper, they may not learn to use another tool. Now, some of the other tools, some of the other things you can do with this tool, which is that earlier. Remember, see how slick that is from our from our skew chisel? 
What do I do if I turn it up on this wing and I bring it in here like this, in this cut right here? What's the difference in that and using my screw chisel? Use actually a little easier to use there. But you see, I got no torn grain there. I got a nice slick finish. So it did a good job. The real advantage to this tool comes from the angle that it's at. So this from the top to here is 60 degrees right here. But as this tool touches the wood in different places, you notice that angle changes, it rolls in. So at some point that, that tool always has a bevel that you can ride on except when you get in a spot where you can't turn it. So let me just show you what I mean. So if I bring this tool right straight in here like that, there's the cutting edge, see it? If I bring this tool in here, there's the bevel. So somewhere between here and here, I've got a place that, are, that I can cut with. So all I gotta do is lay that tool on that bevel and instead of twisting the tool to bring the, the cutting edge into the wood, I'm gonna move the handle towards me until I find that cutting edge right there. There it is, but let me do it this way, this side. So there's my bevel, I get no cut, but as I move my handle away, there it is right there, there's the cut. Because you got that, that variable bevel that always changes. That makes this tool extremely versatile. Now, if you look at that, that's a pretty good cut. This got a little torn. But you remember, this is a piece of soft, you know, har it was, I wanted to say Harbor Freight wood. That's kind of what it is. <laughs> it came from Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, it started out as a two by four. So th <laughs> those are some cuts you could make on a spindle and get a good cut. So uh, I would like to take a minute, if everybody wants to stay with me, if you don't, that's fine too, and show you uh, how to use it on a bowl effectively. So give me a second, change a few things around here. You know, they used to say smoke them if you got them, talk if you want. I don't, I don't think I'm going to send that around to any clubs for auction. I don't think it's going to set the mustard. So you guys are out on that. The uh, president of, of the Pensacola Wood Turners, I can't remember his name right now. Oh, yeah. His name is when I, yeah, when I was talking to him, he handed me two pieces of, of a two by four, just like you had. And he said, you go make yourself a bunch of those. And every day before you start turning anything else, you chuck one of these things up and, and practice all the basic cuts with all the different tools before you ever touch the project, because that'll get you warmed up. Yeah, oh. and I see a lot of turners that do that. And uh, I think that most people, after they've been turning long enough, they don't have to do that. They may choose to do that. Uh, but I see national turners do that. I see them, you know, they go in and they practice a little bit before they turn. A lot of them uh, will turn a top you know, real quick or something, or yeah. turn a little spindle or something like that. So here we, here I have a piece, uh, let's take a look at it here. And all I've done is I've just jammed it in here. It's not really super secure, but I'm gonna put a tenon on it real quick. And the way I'm gonna do that is I always measure my tenons and I have this tool right here and these various holes Tell me my chucks, those are my three big mark chucks. That's a Nova chuck and I got another one over there. And all I do is I drop it on here. Let me slow this lathe down a little bit. I just drop it on here like that and I'm gonna touch it right there. And that's gonna be the, the size uh, tendon that I'm gonna make for this piece. I, I wasn't explaining it well either. So, I'm kind of running out of room here. All right, let's see if I can get in there with that. Yeah. 
Now I'm going to put a face mask on because I'm getting a lot of wood chips in my face. I'm just going to cut right down to this line. We're talking about scrapers. Here's a, here's a scraper, and this has the profile of my chuck on it. So all I have to do is just lay it up here. As long as I keep this edge straight, I'm going to end up with a correct profile for my chuck. Now, I have found over the time that if your piece doesn't run real true, it's probably because right here, you didn't get it good and clean. So what I'm gonna do is I just got a little, uh, here's where that rolled edge comes in. And I wouldn't stick a, a convex ground uh, spindle gouge in this spot. Cause now I got a bevel there, whereas I wouldn't have a bevel before. And I'm just gonna clean that up just like that. That's where I was first having my problems with the grind that I was using and I changed grinds and it worked out really well for me. All right. All right, we got it chucked up. Always use your tail stock if it's available. Never Jack, hurts. we can't yes. we can't see where it's chucked up, so you might need to move the camera out a bit. Well, I want them to. I would prefer that they see what I'm doing instead of the chuck. There's where it's chucked up. You see, I got less than a quarter of an inch gap here, so I've got good contact on it. So the first cut I want to show you with this is a shear cut. So you see how rough this is already here? You can see that this is a piece of, of red ash and it's, it's torn up really, really bad here. So if I used a plain, uh, a plain cut on it, like a roughing cut, I would not be cleaning that up much. But we can go to a, to a shear cut and I'm gonna have to clean it up just a little bit. It's not, not round just yet. So. We're at least on it round. All right. went completely out of focus, Jack. Yeah. I, it'll get in focus when I get it round here in a second. Hopefully. It's picking up the different colors in the wood. Okay. Well, hey. Why don't we just... Mm. Go to a different camera then, okay? That was weird. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, let me, let me adjust this camera here and you can see with it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here for this cut is I wanna smooth this up. Say I've already got it round and I just wanna clean it up. I wanna drop my handle down and I wanna come in just like I used that shear cut it, when I talk about this being a skew on a spindle, I'm going to do that same cut here. Okay, I'm going to drop my handle down. I'm going to catch it up here on the wing. It's still not quite round, so... What part of the uh, beveled are you cutting on, Jack? Is it up near the, just off the tip? I am cutting, Jason, right here, right in that spot where it was, where I showed you it was yep. there before. Yep. Except I'm, I'm cutting on this yep. right wing instead of this left one because I got my bowl backwards. Normally I'd, I'd do all this outside work before I flip my bowl around. Let me see if I can reset this camera. Uh, 
I know there's a way. I'll come out. Okay. IT is going to come help me, folks. <laughs> I used to call her my roommate, and she said, we've been married for 30 years. I think you can move on. I said, okay. I can take a hint. All right. I want to, as soon as I get this other camera in, and I don't know why it quit. Maybe it's got dust on it. Oh, that didn't fix it. Can you reset camera two? Yeah. I'm trying to learn how to do this, folks. I might actually have to do this by myself sometime. Anyway, so let me move on to, to I, I wanted you to see that. Maybe we'll get to it in a second. I can always come back to it. So that's that was a sheer cut that was made on this wing right here. Okay, nice and slow. I've got this, this tool here about 45 degrees this way. Okay, can you put it on? Okay, great. I've got the tool about 45 degrees this way and I've got it about 45 degrees up and down and I'm making it sure, look at, look at the cut I got. You see that? Yeah, it's good. That, that battery died on that. Yeah. Oh. No need for sandpaper. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I could cut it. It's still got some tear out from before that I didn't clean out. So here's the, here's where it was, some of the spalding went in. I, I, I could make another cut on it. Let me, let me show you a sheer scrape. Now, sure, that's a sheer cut where the flute is open right here. Okay, I'm gonna roll this over, this tool over, and I'm gonna use this lower wing right here on this side with this upper wing just barely off the wood. And I'm gonna make a, as soon as Stephanie's out of the line of fire. So I'm gonna make a, a sheer scrape, which means the angles are gonna be the same as that sheer cut. I'm gonna have 45 degrees here and 45 degrees here only I'm just going to reposition the flute. I'm going to close the flute all the way down. It's dead. Okay. So, all right. So here, here comes this, this, the scrape. The bottom wing is going to touch. The top wing's barely off. Shear scrape. You notice I actually ended up with more tear out here than I did with the. Oh, wrong camera. Okay. I actually end. Thank you. I actually end up with more tear out here than I did with the uh, with the shear cut, which does not really surprise me. You know, because a bevel a a bevel supported cut generally will give you a better finish than a a scrape which is not supported so let's go back and see if we can clean it up a little bit see what we get so zach why would you ever use a scrape if you can use the cut because there are places where you can't get a cut there are places where all you can get is a scrape i'm gonna roll it till it starts to cut See, see what I'm getting? See that fine little hair? Here, let me stop that. Get my hand under here. Hang on a minute, folks. We're, we're having a few camera issues. I want that camera on. That camera, please. There. See what I'm getting? These fine little shavings off of here? These little wispy pieces? That's what I want to get with that cut. And you notice I don't have any tear out. So, back to I don't have any tear out anywhere on this bowl. So I've, I, I've eliminated what I just got with the shear scrape, and I've eliminated what was already there before I started. 
So that's the outside. Let's, let's work on the inside a little bit. And I'm gonna be done here in just a minute. Because like a lot of you, I worked all day today and, and uh, I'm pretty tired. Let's uh, get this out of our way. All right, so I've got I've got my tool rest set where my tool is going to end up in, in the center. See that right there? I'm right in the center of the wood. That's where I want to be. And I'm going to start, uh, I'm just going to start scooping this wood out, so to speak. Okay. On the outside of the wood, like we were at earlier, on the outside of the wood, I want to cut from the this way so that I'm cutting downhill. So this would be the grain here, like this. I want to cut downhill. So I want to cut this way so that the fibers underneath are supporting the fiber I'm cutting so that it doesn't tear out. If you don't have it supported, if I tried to cut this wood back that way, it'd have tear out all through it. So when I go to the other side, when I go to the inside, I want to cut from the outside to the inside. So here I'm going to cut from the inside to the outside. Here I'm cutting from the outside to the inside so that here again, I have supported fibers, okay? Anchor, bevel, start to cut. Now, what may happen sometimes, turning a bowl, if you like to turn steep wall bowls, this 60 degrees is gonna cause you a problem making a transition from the bottom. Let me see if I can show you that. If I were trying to go in here to this corner right here, okay, on a deep bowl, I couldn't pull my hand back far enough to make that trans transition. So this is not going to be the 60 degree bowl gouge may not work for you. One way to kind of sneak past that is to learn how to drop the handle down and come up here. But that's not a really good supported cut and it may get you in trouble if you're not used to it. Now you're asking about a shear cut versus a shear scrape, Richard. Yeah. I can't make a cut in there. There's no way for me to make a shear cut in there, but I can drop this over like this and make a scrape. Yeah. Like yeah. So that's that's where that comes in handy. Now, the the advantage, another thing you can do with this tool is I told you about it has a variable angle. So if I come over here, okay, you see that tool is not cutting. I'm only got one hand on this tool. That tool is not cutting. But if if I push this handle away from me, watch this. I haven't turned that tool at all. The opening is still the same. That's bouncing a little, so let me put my finger on it, stop the bounce. See, now I'm getting a cut. If I drop it back towards me, I get no cut. Mm -hmm. So that allows me to, to engage my bevel in a safe manner. Now that flute is open wide open. Some people tell you, you know, if you get that flute open wide open where you can see down the bottom of it, you, you can get a catch. You can turn it over like this, but you won't get the same cut, okay? You won't. So it's a, it's, a, it's a cut you've got to kind of practice, but it's not cutting it safe as long as you don't do this. As soon as you twist that and engage that wing, or worse, twist it that way and engage that wing, you're going to have a massive catch really quick. So that's the last, unless anybody can think of anything, that's the last cut I was going to show you out there. And we'll stop this thing and take a look at it and see, see how clean the cut we got. Well, we actually got a pretty clean cut with that. Somebody told me, I think it was Don Geiger told me that, that they call that a finishing cut. I don't know, but that's, you know, you could, you could easily start with 220. I mean, excuse me, uh, probably 180 sandpaper on that. It's not quite 220 yet, but there are no tool marks in it and there is no torn grain in it. So does anybody have any questions? Here again on this tool, if if this tool gets dull on you, 
you can take a hone and hone the edge of it. And you can also take a hone and put on the inside. And I use this two on some wet wood. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. But you can just lay. It's blurry. <laughs> Do you know how to reset the camera? Right. Know how to go to it. Yep. Okay. See there? How I reset that? So you can, take, you, you can take this little half round right here and just lay it in here and hit it a couple of licks like that. And you can tell that it's, it's razor sharp again. I mean, that's, I that's a very use, short gouge there. Yeah, that one. This is the first bowl gouge I ever bought like 14 years ago. Wow. It's turned a lot, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of bowls. So. I, I use a, a little Arkansas stone a hard Flip Arkansas stone. stone that's uh it's it's oh boy <laughs> it's uh, round on the bottom and it's v-shaped and then it's got a little teardrop. round on the top yeah teardrop thank you teardrop. Mm -hmm. and uh because it can get into all kinds of neat little places yep so does anybody have any questions hand tools and whatnot uh, we, we had some other people join us from other clubs. Thank you for joining us. Most of you kind of, I guess your faces are out there. I never got to see them, but uh, I'm, sh I'm sure you're out there somewhere. Uh, this was the first time we did this. I had a few catches and I, you know, and I'm one of those people that uh, if I have a catch, I'll, I'll tell you about it. And I know why I have them. That doesn't necessarily alleviate the fact that I'm going to have more of them because I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and every time I demo, I tell people that don't demo. If you don't demo because you're afraid to have a catch, you'll never stand in front of people. So everybody has his catches. Yeah. I've seen, I think every professional turner that I know, except for maybe one. No, I, he's had a catch too. Have catches. So you have them. Don't be afraid of them. You know, the best thing to do is stop when you have one. Turn the lathe off. Look at what you did with the tool against the wood with the lathe turned off, and you can figure out why you had it. Doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to have it again, but you'll be able to analyze it. And in some cases, what you'll figure out is the tool you're using really doesn't work well for what you're trying to do with it. You know, maybe you should sharpen it differently to help eliminate that. Take a breath. So Think about it. Folks, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Exactly. You're welcome. Everybody have a nice night. Thank you, everybody else from the other clubs for joining me. You know, if you guys enjoyed it, since this was a first, you think it, uh, think we should, I should work on it a little bit and, and maybe next time I actually make a syllabus to kind of go by so I don't ramble around. Let me know. So, no, maybe I I'll be back. We didn't ramble at all. It was super helpful. Uh -huh. it was very good. good. That was very good. Get me well. out of here. <laughs> very good. Very good. Very thank nice. You, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jack. Good, good night. It. Thank you. Thank you.